Hi everyone, welcome to the first lesson on Crash Course on Indian History from Prehistory to Independence. I'm Nandini and I'll be starting with this course. I've done my undergrad in history. So here we'll basically talk about the Stone Age, the Harappan civilization and the Vedic and the later Vedic period and a little bit about the megalithic cultures. Okay, so let's start. Stone Age is basically called the Stone Age because people are using stone tools at this point predominantly. There are no other tools, right? And it's divided into three parts that is Paleolithic, Mesolithic and Neolithic. And this part is called prehistory because there are absolutely no written records. History is when the rec written records start, okay? And people of the Stone Age are also called hunter-gatherers and they live near water bodies. Why? Because that is basically their means of subs sustenance, right? We need water. So, that is where most of the settlements are found. Now, the Paleolithic Age was a very, very, very long period, okay? The longest period of Stone Age from 2.5, 50,000 years ago to 10,000 years ago, right? And it basically had very, very, it had many ice ages and it is divided Sorry, it's divided into three periods, the Lower Paleolithic, Middle Paleolithic and Upper Paleolithic. And uh, for this period, we have some sites in Pakistan, Kashmir, Rajasthan, Uttar Pradesh, Madhya Pradesh, Peninsular India, etc. So this is just the background of life beginning in the Indian subcontinent. Then we come to the Mesolithic period. This period is most important for its art. Bhim Betka the Madhya Pradesh, you must Google this and see it. And Bagor in Rajasthan had domesticated animals at this point of time. So this Mesolithic period had features of both Paleolithic and Neolithic time. Neolithic is the new stone age, right? And uh, therefore, we see some basic, you know, those Paleolithic kind of tools as well. And we see the Neolithic characteristic of domestication of plants and animals a little bit. Why did this start happening? Because as we studied, the Paleolithic age had many, many ice ages. Plants weren't able to go, grow that much. But in the Mesolithic age, the climate stabilized and it grew a little bit warmer. And therefore, there was a diversification of uh, the biology around, the ecology around. And... Uh, that's why these changes began to happen. Then finally, we come to the Neolithic, that is the new stone age. Now here there is a substantially warmer climate and there are new plants and therefore there's a proper development of agriculture and domestication from 10,000 BC. And we also see the use of fire. And this development of agriculture and domestication is called the Neolithic revolution. There is a question on whether or not it's actually a revolution because uh, the development of agriculture actually took like thousands of years. So, and you generally associate idea of revolution with something very rapid. So, this is a general historiographic debate that goes on between historians. So, you can think a little bit about it, but not too much if you're not taking history as your optional, okay? And uh, we find evidence of uh, agriculture earliest in Iraq, Iran, Israel, etc. But in India, the most important site is Mehergar, that is in Baluchistan, Pakistan. And this site is on the route from India to Kand Kandar in Afghanistan and it's on the Bolan River, that is near the Bolan Pass. And it was occupied around 7000 to 2500 BCE. It has houses, domesticated cattle, this is like 7000 BCE means about 9000 years before, right? So that's really, really, really long time back. And they have sheep and goat and they have had domesticated plants as well they grew wheat barley they had pottery and there are more sites of the neolithic age that is in afghanistan burzam and gufrakal in kashmir parts of rajasthan assam meghalaya andhra pradesh etc so various various parts of india did have neolithic sites and agriculture long time like nine thousand years back then we come to the harappan civilization this is one of the most ancient civilization in the world and uh, its uh, founding date has been pushed back a little and it's now in 3300 BCE. Earlier we used to say that it's around okay, 2500 BCE. So they found older evidence. okay, And it ended around 1800 BCE. Ended as in it declined, not ended. And uh, it was an urban civilization. That means that perhaps its main base was not agriculture. There was a lot of trade and you know labor mobilization etc you know building construction work all that happening so the basic means of livelihood was people of people was probably not 
agriculture and it was along the indus plains of course it covers most of pakistan and large chunks of northern and uh, central india and not central central as in it goes up till uttar pradesh gujarat etc so northwestern and northern india mostly and uh, southern afghanistan it was discovered by john marshall in 1924 and john marshall was the director general of asi archaeological survey of india and this is a proto historic civilization that means that it has some written history but we have not deciphered it yet so that is what i mean by proto historic yes there are written sources but we don't know how to read them so more or less for us it becomes a prehistoric civilization only right then after the decline of the uh after the decline of the harappan civilization not much really happened but we do know that the rig ved was written and there was a bit of uh, hunter gatherer societies again so these are we go back in time we do not have so much of urban civilization anymore and in the later vedic period that is between 10000 bce to 600 bce early vedic is around 1500 to 10 1000 bce okay so in the later vedic period there were settlements around the ganges plains and parts of the rigveda and the rest of all the sama yajur and atharveda were composed and many of the other vedic texts like uh, epics etc were composed so you know ramayana and mahabharata was slowly composed over the years and beginnings of straight structure caste system development of hinduism was happening at this point of time and agriculture was the mainstay of people and performance of sacrifices began and also there was the development of weapons use of copper lots of different different types of pottery and then we come a little bit south and we talk about the megalithic cultures so here we see that there are no written records of south or of life in southern india corresponding to the vedic age in north india of course for the vedic age we have the vedas but um, in south india the most important source is are the burials and the burials are actually quite magnificent they are megalithic graves megalith means like a big stone boulder okay and these graves are found all over peninsular india and that is what we use to study them and this is what is called megalithic culture so uh, it's you know stuff like this can be asked because it's such an important part of our history and especially like for prelims and stuff it may be asked now burials often contain iron tools pottery bones in urns etc and some megaliths are found in kashmir in the north and in the northeast as well so what did we study in this in this lesson we studied a lot from 2 lakh 50000 years ago to say uh 3000 years ago so we studied a long 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 history so let's just do a quick recap so we studied basically prehistory of the south asian subcontinent in which we studied about the stone ages that is paleo meso and neolithic stone age and we have no written records for these ages and uh, the agriculture started in the neolithic age and most important sites of india are baluchistan and uh baluchistan is well in pakistan now but mehargarh is a very important site and rest of these there are some sites in rajasthan assam meghalaya andhra etc so north east south west everywhere we have it and then we have the harappan civilization which was discovered by john marshall in 1924 and it was an urban civilization after the decline of the harappan civilization we went back to say uh, hunter gatherers and tribal societies in the later vedic period where the vedas were composed and we see how many changes and development of weapon and use of copper etc is happening then we had a glance at southern india and we talked about the megalithic cultures which are our most important source next lesson we'll start talking a little bit about the early states thank you so much i hope you enjoyed and i hope it helps you get a better view of history if you liked it please rate review and recommend hi everyone in this lesson we'll talk a little bit more about uh indian history beginning from the early states that is from the mahajanpata this is the cash course on indian history and it's presented by me nandini maharaj i have done my undergrad in history from lady shri ram college so we'll talk about the mahajanpatas and most importantly the rise of magadh the incoming of alexander the mauryas and under the mauryas ashok and then we'll talk a little bit about the various diverse thought systems that were there that is buddhism jainism and ajivikas so the mahajanpatas were early states that began to develop around 600 bce and uh, 
what was actually there is that this were in these were mostly in north india and they were cities and towns that means from the early and later vedic hunter gatherers or agriculturists or uh, tribes we are shifting now to urbanization again and uh, there were kings and oligarchies that is early state structures were being formed and there were all these changes in the society economy polity in the fabric of the life of india at this point of time coins were being issued use of iron was there weapons were being constructed and manufactured irrigation works were taking place kings were keeping armies and imposing taxes etc so modern states as we understand it that was building little 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 so the mahabad janpatas were the great states and they were approximately 16 and these had capital cities which were fortified again you see you know capital cities are what centers of political power so that is happening and uh, this is the period of development of various the and diverse thought systems like buddhism and jainism which we'll study about and uh, magadh was the most important mahajanpada so you can read a little bit more about this if you want to and even if you don't want to you can go through my course on ancient history from ncrt but we'll just be talking about Ma- magadh in this summary course of ours right so where was magadh magadh was the area of bihar bengal jharkhand eastern up nepal etc and this area was very very prosperous why because it had a lot of resources it has rivers you know ganga fl- flows through there and some of its tributaries as well it had forests it had elephants it had copper and iron you know uh, jharkhand has a lot of mines it had fertile soils again it's on the ganga basin and it was in the midst of all important trade routes you know from uh, asia to from india to the rest of china myanmar etc so that area and six dynasties ruled it but most of them are not important what is important is uh, haranyaka dynasty's bimbisara he was the first important ruler of magadh he married a lichavi princess and expanded the kingdom to diplomatic and mar- marital alliances he apparently had about 500 wives and a little bit of battle so bimbisara we know about him a lot his son was ajata shastru so haranyaka dynasty is quite important he and his son and yeah so they are important and uh, he apparently he committed patricide that is killed his father but we we are not very sure of that right then there was the shaishunga dynasty then there was the nanda dynasty nanda dynasty began with mahapadma nanda and ended with dhananda but it's important because alexander the great came to india during the reign of the nandas we'll read about him too okay so throughout this political journey of magadh the empire kept expanding slowly 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 it kept expanding so who was alexander alexander was the king of macedonia this is near greece in uh, 336 bce and he conquered persia and he actually even conquered egypt he had a vast 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 empire he wanted to rule the world essentially but when he came to conquer india what happened was that his army was very tired they had been fighting for about a decade anyone would get tired after that right and they uh, came to this portion of uh, India so the nandas were controlling the controlling the northern india and the rest were ruled by independent kingdoms and he, alexander was even held by one independent kingdom of taxila but king porus who was along river jhelum he fought alexander now his tired army saw the elephants of india he saw, they saw porus's elephants and they got like really really scared and they were like listen alexander we ain't going into that battle okay and they left and alexander obviously had to return but he did build a lot of cities along his war path and bukefela he built on jhelum now bukefela is named after his horse who he loved very very much who was called bucephalus and uh, yeah it's one of the pairs of history alexander and bucephalus okay and uh, but what happened with alexander's invasions was that other greeks came in close contact with india after him so we'll keep reading about many many indo greeks and other central asian empires in india okay so let's talk about the mauryas they were the next most 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 important dynasty of magadh so guys don't get confused a lot of people get confused between magadh and mauryas magadh is the land it's the area mauryas are the empire it's the dynasty please don't get confused with that i used to get really confused so i'm clarifying it so mauryas ruled between uh 231 Uh, 321 to 180 BCE. So even though they are considered like a great empire, they just 
ruled for like 150 years which is not that long right and uh, chandragupta maurya defeated dhananda of the nanda dynasty and he had a very important minister called chanakya or kautilya who wrote arthashastra shastra this is a very 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 important source of history please remember it another source is indica by megasthenes megasthenes was the uh, diplomat of seleucus nicator okay he was a greek king and he sent his diplomat megasthenes to chandragupta maurya's court and megasthenes wrote indica we don't actually have the book indica but we have bits and pieces of it so we count it as a source then chandragupta actually became a jain monk and his son bindusara so don't again get confused between bimbisara and bindusara bindusara is the son of chandragupta maurya bimbisara is the first uh, uh important ruler of magadha that is of the haranyaka dynasty so bimbisara and bindusara okay and um, he believed in ajivika philosophy what is this we'll see very soon and he probably invaded south india but we are not very sure but we are definitely sure that ashok did expand his empire a lot ashok is very 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 important why because we still use his symbols today rashtrapati bhavan make in india our emblem everything is derived a lot of our national symbols are derived from ashoka's rule and even our national movement was very very inspired by king ashok and they really looked up to him and they said that hey if our if people of our land can do this if they can maintain such vast empires and have such positive thoughts then why can't we and so ashok gave a lot of confidence to the national movement of india and he was really influenced by buddhism and therefore he spoke of tolerance kindness respect and dhamma and he Im- even employed dhamma mahatmas and he used to uh, write his uh, thoughts and uh, his idea of dhamma and spread it to all places spear is spread sorry guys and he was the only ruler that we know of in history who gave up war after winning it this is i'm talking about the kaling war and he adopted the title of devanam priya priyadarshini yani ki which means beloved of the gods now we come to buddhism we'll talk about buddhism jainism and ajivika philosophy so buddhism was founded around 600 bce by gautam buddh who was of the shakya gan again one of the mahajanpatas born in lumbini that is nepal you have to remember where he was born okay he was enlightened under the people tree at bodhgaya again you have to remember this and he gave his first sermon at sarnath and he attained moksha at kusinara this pit 100% please remember it ingrain it in your minds ingrain it in in your memory okay and he taught orally in vernacular which is you know very very different from how brahmanism worked they taught so such as small pe- class of people just who understood sanskrit so he taught in vernacular that is in prakrit that was the vernacular of that time and his teachings are compiled in the ti pitaka vinaya pitaka sutta pitaka and abhi dhamma pitaka and he emphasized human agency kindness rationality righteous action and all this to en- escape the cycle of reincarnation and early buddhism including gautam buddha did not speak about god so much and uh, about buddhism you have to study about the architecture that is the stupas they are very important you can study about the stupa of sachi of uh Ara- amravati etc and uh, you can also go through my course on ancient indian history to, from the ncrts to learn a little bit more about the stupas etc then we come to jainism jainism was uh, initiated by mahavir who was a person of the prince of the lichavi gan again one of the mahajanpata and this was between uh, again 6th century bce and his followers are known as jains and he said that there were 23 tirthankara that is teachers before him he said that the entire world is animated and therefore we have to be non violent towards everything and he said he believed in kindness and truth and that his literature everything that he said and other ideas that sprouted from jain thought are contained in prakrit tamil and sanskrit and uh, currently they are maintained at valabhi in gujarat and there were two sects of followers the digambaras who wore nothing and the shwetambaras who wore white clothes okay then lastly we come to ajivikas and they were a sect led by goshala mas ka riputra and he was a disciple of uh, mahavir himself and he believed that everything is predetermined so do whatever you want essentially but the ajivika monks 
who were there they practiced severe penance even though they believed that destiny cannot be altered and you can do whatever you want everything is predetermined yet it was by choice they say that they practiced severe severe penance that's all we'll talk a little bit more about uh, ancient india for a couple of lessons then we'll move on to medieval i really hope that you're enjoying these courses please don't forget to rate review and recommend thank you Hi guys this is the fifth part of our course crash course on indian history from prehistory to independence i'm nandini and i'm presenting this course to you i've done my undergrad from history so in this lesson we'll be talking about the sangam literature chera chora pandyas and the guptas all of these are very 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 important kingdoms and themes of our indian history so we need to know about them sangam literature was written around 300 BCE to 300 CE so around a 6 700 period of formation and it's got sangam because it was uh, consolidated at three literary meetings or sangams in madurai and uh, this literature is in tamil and they have two epics just like we have our epics we north indians have our epics of mani mekalai of uh, ramayan and mahabharat sangam literature has two epics mani mekalai by satyanar and sila padikaram by ilanga and these uh, this literature describes life in southern india which and it is a very important source of the cultural political and social history of those times so even if you you know don't properly study about sangam literature you don't have the time because this is not a very high yield top topic as such at max one question will come so even if you just keep this particular slide in mind if anything come comes you will be able to answer it you know they even asked a question out of mains from this so you need to know a little bit about sangam literature for sure even if you don't have the time to go and learn up like learn it up like you study the national movement just remember these few things and you will be able to at least attempt it then let's talk about chera chola pandyas these three chiefs together were called muvendra and they ruled the ancient uh, country of tamilakam that is you know all of uh, what we call south india today andhra kerala tamil nadu and little bits of karnataka as well and so the pandyas ruled for a very 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 long time 1100 years 600 bce to 1600 ce and their capital was madurai and they traded with rome and we'll keep referring back to the pandyas i think throughout this course then we'll talk about the cholas they ruled from 3rd century bce to 13th century bce again about uh, 10 1100 years and uh, they were northeast of the pandyas pandyas ruled basically the tamil area and their capitals was urayur which was the inland capital and puhar the coastal capital and this was the very fertile land between pennar and velar rivers and some things that you need to know about them very 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 important that is the brihadeshwara temple gangai konda cholapuram was built in 1035 by raja rajaban who built it where this temple is who is this temple about please go and study the history geography art architecture art everything about this temple okay they have asked a short note on this once in the past 10 years of the main and also uh, the chinese traveler chao jukao came to the chola court in the 13th century then we'll talk about the cheras finally cheras ruled present day kerala and they were there from the 3rd to the 10th century ce 3rd century bce to 10th century ce very long lasting empire in heat and their capital was murchi and karur now we come to the guptas very very important wonderful things happening in the art culture society economy etc so let's see the first ruler was shri gupta and the most important ruler was uh, chandragupta one who was there from 320 to 335 ce so don't confuse him with chandragupta maurya who was there around the same time bce so around 600 years ago under the mauryas of magadh then there's chandragupta one of the guptas who's in 2320 and 333 ce okay so this ce and bce makes a huge difference okay and they ruled over magadh prayag saketa etc east up bihar that area and samudra gupta was his son who ruled from 335 to 380 ce and we know a lot about him because of an inscription on an ashokan pillar by samudra gupta's court poet hari sena who said that uh, samudra gupta fought many battles performed the ashwamedha sacrifice played the veena wrote poetry matlab all round like a top notch guy samudra gupta okay 
Then there was Chandragupta II and we also know him as Vikramaditya who is there from uh, 380 to 412 CE and his daughter Prabhavati Gupta was a Vakataka queen. She married the Vakataka uh, king I think Rudrasena and then when he passed away she ruled in his name in his stead and she was the queen of the Vakataka kingdom. And uh, the iron pillar in Kutub Minar describes Chandragupta II that is Vikramaditya. Again, don't confuse all the several thousand Chandraguptas we have in our history, okay? Be very clear which one is which. Fazian visited India during the reign of Chandragupta II, okay? Not Chandragupta I, not Chandragupta Maurya, Chandragupta II. Fazian, the Chinese pilgrim. Again, then we have Kumar Gupta, Skand Gupta. Skand Gupta defeated the Hunas of Central Asia. And after them, there were small and weak Gupta rulers, but the empire really began to decline. But what was important was that the economy, art and culture had flourished under these early Guptas, okay? The Bhagavad Gita, Mahabharat, Ramayana, etc. attained their final forms. Kalidas wrote at this point of time, I'm sure you know about the books of Kalidas. You really, really have to know, okay? And there were, uh, there were other important writers as well, like Bhasa and Sudraka. You should look up these people if you haven't, uh, if you don't already know about them. They are very important uh, creative personalities of our history. Then there was Aryabhatta. I'm sure you've heard of him. And he also wrote Aryabhattam, the book named after himself. And uh, under the Guptas, Buddhist sculpture really took off and there are temples uh, of Devgarh, Bhitargaon and Bitari built, they, they are all in UP, okay? So these really, really important, which are still important places of pilgrimage are built, were built by the Guptas. And Nalanda University was also founded under them. Also, we can go on and on talking about the wonderful time that the Guptas lived and had. Um, the cities and ports were built, urbanization was uh, in full boom, crafts diversified, artisans and traders benefits, foreign trade boomed, gold coins were plentiful and perhaps this was the golden age of Indian history. We are not so sure because a lot of writers say that we only think so well about the gold about the Gupta period because first of all we studied a lot about them see we got to know about this dynasty and we were like hey let's study more and more and second of all we found a lot of sources so we don't really know what was happening in the rest of the empires because we don't have the same kind of sources for them and also the idea of golden age and dark age has now been abandoned by historians we see things more in terms of change and continuity so golden age is not so much a historically correct term anymore but perhaps when we see all the wonderful research that has been done on the Guptas we can make that uh, conclusion that yes maybe it was a really really nice time and um, the Gupta history actually gave a lot of pride and confidence to the national movement under the colonial rule so we talked about Ashoka and now we're talking about Guptas right Thank you. I hope you enjoyed and uh, we'll keep talking a little bit more and slowly, slowly move towards the Delhi Sultanate now, right? We have a thousand years left in the Delhi Sultanate. Thank you. Hi guys, in this lesson, we're going to continue with our crash course on Indian history, prehistory to independence. I'm Nandini and in the part four, we'll be talking a little bit more about some of the early empires. Now, why are we talking about so many empires? Because they were, there were so many empires. There were small, small states all over India and they kept rising and going down. So we need to know about them because they are a vibrant part of our history. Okay. I'm Nandini. I've done my undergrad in history. So in this, we'll talk about Magadh after the Mauryas. And then we'll talk about empires of the Northwest. So remember when I told you that Alexander opened the doors of India to uh, the Greeks and Central Asians, etc. So we'll talk about that, okay? The Indo-Greeks, the Scythians, the Parthians. And we'll look a little bit towards Central India as well. And we'll talk about Urisa and Satwans. Uh, but Kushans are again Indo-Greeks of uh, Northern Central India. So don't confuse that, okay? This is not uh, geographically arranged, the content list. Magad after the Maurya. So last Mauryan king was Bhreda Ratha. And he was killed by Pushya Mitra Shunga. Uh, his own army commander and after that so Mauryas were the dynasty we were talking about okay so we are talking about the dynasties that followed the Mauryas uh, there was the Shunga dynasty and then Magadh which ruled Magadh and the Gangetic Valley and they even checked the advance of the Indo-Greeks and after that there were the Kansas and much later the uh, Magadh area was ruled by Gupta so all of these dynasties are not important but because they were dynasties of this very important place we have discussed them we'll talk in detail about Guptas later.
in my next lesson okay so we'll talk about empire of the northwest so what happened is that in 200 bce shi huang ti who was a chinese king he built the great wall of china to keep out the central asians so that they couldn't come now if they can't go there where will they go they'll come to india right uh, because there's that great wall of china and then over this side there's the himalaya so they'll come to india through the pakistan area so that is what happened and the indo greeks let's start with talking about what all central asian tribes came so first were the scythians and they began attacking the indo greeks of bactria so these people so the indo greeks were basically the people who had settled during alexander's invasions and stuff okay and when the scythians attacked them they started moving inwards towards india and they conquered large parts up to up so all of you know punjab and haryana and large parts of punjab uh, pakistan bits of kashmir etc these people even issued coins and meander minander is one of his fa- one of the famous rulers of the indo greeks and his capital was silaka or silakot in pakistan and we know about him through this book called milind the panha which is also considered an important buddhist text and it's a dialogue between minander who was the king and nagasena who was a buddhist monk so because sources are important in general when we are talking about history we have to talk about, know about minander now we talk about the scythians the scythians who had pushed indo greeks out of central asia into india they occupied bactria and they were attacked by another <laughs> central asian tribes okay so it's going on and on and on like this and these tribes are being pushed into india and they moved to india and they are the ones who we called shakas okay you must have heard about the shaka kingdom you might not have heard about scythians because they're called the shakas in india and they established a kingdom with taxila as their capital and they really moved inwards into mathura etc okay and a branch of shakas ruled the western india so this is another branch and their famous king was rudradaman who constructed the sudarshan lake then we come to the parthians the parthians were from iran and they moved into northwest india in the 1st century ad so till now we basically been talking about bc times okay bce and uh, one of their famous ruler was gondofir nis i don't know if i'm pr- probably not pronouncing that right okay and under his rule saint thomas and op- apostle of christ came and this is really really important okay now he came in kerala so that connection with parthians is not important the importance is the timeline okay what time did he come when the parthians were ruling india bits of northwestern india so saint thomas landed in kerala and that is why uh, many kerala christians are called saint thomas christians and finally the parthians were overthrown by kushans so we studied about three indo uh, three P- central asians the indo greeks the shakas and the parthians now we'll talk about orissa you know that this was called the kalinga empire and it en- asserted its independence from magadh in the 1st century uh, ad sorry don't use ad too much okay you ce uh, now that is common era and before common era not bc and ad and their most famous ruler was kharavela and uh, we know about him through the inscription in hathi gumpha cave in udayagiri hill and he was a follower of jainism again just i'm giving you a general picture of who all were the ruling empires and kingdoms of india during the ancient times we only know about mauryas and the guptas we don't know so much about the rest of our history and it's really important to know because the problem is that our entire history is focused upon certain certain central indian and north indian and the tropes around the ganga plains and we ignore the history of rest of india and therefore we fall back and we make people who are not from the gangetic plains feel alienated so we need to know it we need to be aware of our history we need to be aware so that we can integrate ourselves so that we can identify with each other better okay so let's go on and then we talk about the kushans and they were again central asians who displaced the shakas and overthrew the parthian and they were there for about 200 years and they had two capitals in one in peshawar that is in pakistan and one in mathura and they made like huge huge sculptures and they used to issue gold coins so they were really rich and they controlled the silk route etc and kanishk was their most famous ruler and they were overthrown by sasanians in the northwest and guptas in the north so sasanians we don't have to talk about because that's not so much about uh, indian history but guptas we will talk about let's talk a little bit more about kushans though gandhara are developed under them this was like a greek or roman style this is very very important to know okay we talked about gold coins and sculptures and yeah they patronized mahayana buddhism and ashwagosh who was um, 
court poet in one of the Kushan's, uh, Kushan King's courts. He wrote Buddha Charitra. And uh, under their uh, reign, Natya Shastra was also written by Bharat. And uh, things like um, astronomy, astrology and medicine developed. And Chakra uh, was a very important, Charak was an important scientist writer. And he wrote Charak Samhita. Sorry, this slide is repeated for some reason. Anyway, we come to the Satvans now. And the Satvans, who are also known as the Andras, were an empire of the Deccan. They were called Lords of Takshin Pata. But like that is the Lords which ruled the area which led to south. And uh, they ruled between the 2nd century BCE and the 2nd century CE. And their most famous ruler is Gautami Puta Satkarni. And they defeated the Shakas of Western India. They were Brahmins and uh, their uh, names were derived from their mother's side. That is, they followed metronymic system. But of course, they were still patrilineal and patriarchal. And under them, Prakrit literature flourished and Buddhism also flourished. Chaityas, uh, Q is not supposed to be there. Chaityas, that is the prayer halls and Virahas, that is the monasteries, were built by them. And some were carved straight out of rock. And Karle which is in Maharashtra, is one of the famous virahas that was built under the Satvahanas. So that's all for this lesson. I hope you enjoyed it. We'll talk about Guptas in the next lesson. And I hope you are getting a clearer and clearer picture of Indian history as we move from prehistory to independence. Thank you. Hi everyone, in this lesson we are going to continue our story of ancient Indian empires and the very interesting and different different aspects of each of these individual unique kingdoms. I am Nandini and I'll be teaching you the crash course on modern history from pre-history pre to independence. I did my undergrad in history. So we are going to be talking about so many different different dynasties and we are going to be connecting each and every one of these with the important cultural and social developments that took place under them. So let's begin. First we will talk about the Vakatakas. These were there in Maharashtra and Madhya Pradesh during the 3rd to 6th century CE. Sorry that means around for 4 hundred years and uh, Berar was their capital and the finder was Vindya Shakti and Rudra Sena was one of the famous kings whose wife Prabhavati Gupta was the queen, became the queen after his death. So it's important they had a female queen and they were all Brahmins, the Vakadakas and they gave land grants to Brahmins as well and they recorded this on copper plates. So these copper plates are our basic source for the Vakatakas. Next kingdom, the Ish Ikshuvakus. These ruled the Krishna Godavari deltas of eastern India and they region they ruled was called Vengi and this was again a short empire in the 3rd century CE and they followed Vedic and Buddhist religion and their capital was Nagarjun Konda. Now you have to read a little bit about Nagarjun Konda because it is still a very very important stupa uh, in Andhra Pradesh and it's a Buddhist site and it's still used so you need to know about them and you need to know, you need to know that they were under the issue, it was built under the issue Ikshuvaku's dynasty. Then we come to the Kadambas. They were the southwestern and north Karnataka empire during the 4th to 6th century BC. So we are talking about this time only around, you know, 3rd to 7th century CE. Think about all these empires from that time. And the famous ruler was uh, Mayur Sharma, who was the founder and he studied Vedas at Kanchipuram and apparently he performed 18 Ashwamedha sacrifices. And he was thrown overthrown by the Chalukyas. We'll read about the Chalukyas later on. Then we'll talk about the Western Gangas. Now, don't get confused. There are Western Gangas and there are Eastern Gangas and none of them are anywhere near the Ganga plains, okay? So, don't get confused with them. They ruled the area of Karnataka between the Pallavas in the east and the Kadambas in the west. So, we need to know about the Western Gangas. They were in the central area of uh, the peninsular side of India. And they were again there from the 4th to 6th century CE. And uh, they their capital was Kolar, where we have the famous gold mine. So we need to know about them. And he ordered the, you must have seen the movie Bahubali, right? So one of the Western Ganga kings, that is King Rajamalla IV, he ordered the construction of the Jain temple at Shavanna Belgola, which has the image of Bahubali or Gomateshwara. So these are some random random things. I don't think that you can potentially remember all of them. Although any of them might be asked from art and culture point of view. So just 
appreciate the story appreciate your rich cultural history and don't get stressed about the exam right now whenever you sit down and study art and culture you can connect it to oh yeah i studied about this in history a little bit okay don't panic right now don't you don't have to take notes of each and every one of these things then there were the eastern gangas who ruled over kaling of course uh, odisha and they built many many temples and the important ones among their temples are of course sun temple at konark 100% you need to know what it is how it is used right now what all are the uh, architectural miracles and everything and you need to know about lingaraj temple and mukteswar temple all these were been built under the eastern gangas so basically we are studying art and culture and we are just connecting it to the poli- polity of that time then there were the pallavas their uh, capital was kanchipuram this is very 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 important because kanchipuram is currently a city under the uh, hriday scheme what is the hriday scheme i'm sure you all know if you don't know please write a look it up and write it in the comment section what is the hriday scheme how many cities are there there is another c- another scheme which is very very similar to the hriday scheme so what scheme is that and a lot of the cities overlap so don't get confused you need to know about that art and culture is becoming more and more important as we go on and move into archaeological preservation and restoration etc okay and uh, yeah so the pallavas they were there and they built kanchipuram and they followed vedic hinduism and very important they made the rock cut temples of mahabali puram and this has the very famous and very beautiful rock sculpture of the de- descent of ganga so all these things the pallavas here are not as important as is kanchipuram city mahabali puram temple and the descent of ganga okay so take it more as an art and culture lesson you need to know about all these things you need to know about the history of india then we come to the chalukyas okay uh they ruled between the vindhyan mountains and the krishna river uh, the, that is basically maharashtra and andhra pradesh and uh, they were established by king pula kesin 1 in the 6th century ce at vatapi which is badami area and pula kesin 2 is the best known king and he really really em- expanded the empire and we know about him through a very famous inscription at a hole and the chinese traveler huan zhang went through his court and wrote about the chalukyas as well then we come to the rashtrakutas they defeated and succeeded the chalukyas so basically the same territory maharashtra andhra and the ajanta and elora caves were built during the reign of the rashtrakutas essentially you need to know about the import very 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 famous and still used and still visited often art and culture sites of india so we are talking about ajanta and elora this is near aurangabad in maharashtra and they are basically rock cut caves with fresco paintings okay what are fresco paintings please mention in the comment section you need to know you need to google it yourself you need to see a couple of pictures and then you'll realize i if even if i tell you it won't do you any good you need to look at it you need to really really internalize what it is then you'll know then we come to the ajanta cave specifically there are 30 buddhist rock cut cave monuments and they date between 2nd century bce to 7th century ce so dheere dheere ye sab bane the and they were built under the satvahanas and the vakatakas and they have ancient monasteries and worship halls and the paintings basically it's a buddhist site then the elora caves they are rock cut monastery temple cave complex and while the ajantas are basically buddhist elora are jainism buddhism and hinduism they have monuments and artworks from all these diverse religions and they were constructed around 600 to 1000 ce and it has the monolithic temple of kailash nath very important and this temple is attributed to the rashtrakuta king krishna one then we study about elephanta caves which are caves of the coast of mumbai if you've been to mumbai you might have been here also you go with a ferry and everything these are shiva and buddhist cave and in the elephanta islands in arabian sea and the huge huge structures and they were built during the 5th to 8th century now we come to finally we go a little bit north and we talk about harshvardhan last lesson we had talked about the gupta empire and we heard we studied that the gupta empire broke up and disintegrated into many small small kingdoms one of the important kingdoms that succeeded the gupta empire was harshvardhan's kingdom he was a very famous ruler and he succeed he was enthroned only when he was like 16 years old and his capital was kannauj and this is described by the chinese traveler huan zhang and huan zhang actually stayed at his court for a bit 
now he ruled over a vast area of uh, punjab haryana uttar pradesh rajasthan bihar and orissa also subsequently and he was first a shaivite but then he slowly converted into buddhism and we know about him more first we know about him because of huan zhang and now we know about him because uh, the his court poet banabhatta wrote a book called harish charitra about him harsh charitra and he was succeeded by yashu varman uh not very important so we've done a lot of history in very quick succession over here so let's uh, revise like quickly the important uh, art and culture things that we've talked about so wakatakas okay they had a queen and they gave land grants and the copper plates are how we know about them then ishkawukas ish ishuvakus we know we need to know about them because they made nagarjun konda which is an important buddhist site in andhra pradesh then kadambas were uh, overthrown by the chalukyas chalukyas not very important western gangas we need to know because uh, one of their uh, kings that is king rajamalla iv uh, constructed the temple of bahubali at uh, shravana belgola then eastern gangas constructed the limbra lingaraj temple the mukteswar temple and the sun temple at konark importantly at kaling that is odisha the pallavas uh made the rock cut temples of mahabalipuram and the beautiful rock sculpture of descent of ganga please keep seeing the images of all these things okay and then okay let's skip the chalukyas in our revision and rashtrakutas we need to talk about because of the ajanta and elora caves ajanta caves are basically buddhist caves and elora caves are more uh, you know diverse in their religious leanings they have jainism buddhism and hinduism and the kalashnath monolithic rock cut temple is here and then we have the elephant attack caves finally and we have the famous harshvardhan who ruled over large large territories of north india and his capital was kannauj and we know about him through ban bhatta's writings that is harsha charitra thank you so much i hope you enjoyed i hope you got a clue of how to study art and architecture and art and culture and how to connect it with history See you in the next lesson. Bye. Hi guys, we're going to continue talking about some of the early states and we are going to move a little bit more into the first second millennium BCE CE, second millennium CE, sorry. And uh, I'm Nandini and I'll be teaching you this course that is a cash course on all of Indian history from prehistory to independence. This is the part 7 of the course and I'm Nandini and I did my undergrad in history honors. So let's start. We'll be talking about the Rajputs a lot in this lesson. So these are all uh, Rajput kingdoms. Then we'll talk a little bit about some other kingdoms and we'll concentrate on society and culture underneath them, okay? So who were the Rajputs? We don't know. That's the funniest thing. Their origin is a subject of debate. Maybe they came from uh, some invasions from northwestern india and even above northwestern india that is from uh, central asia etc but mythically they are born out of fire from mount abu that is how we recognize them and they gained political prominence after the decline of the guptas and they integrated into the kshatriya varma varn so now of course we all recognize rajputs as belonging to the kshatriya varn and there were actually many different clans and tribes uh, historically there are 36 but actually there are much more and they were an important obstacle to the arab muslim invaders like mohammad of ghazni and mohammad of ghor sorry it's mahmud of ghazni this is a misspelling so it's mahmud of ghazni and mohammad of ghor so first of the rajputs that we'll talk about are the gujjar pratiharas they are also known just as the pratiharas okay they ruled from jodhpur over rajasthan and they slowly extended their empire to gujarat and ujjain and they were there from the 6th century ce to the 11th century ce and uh, king bhoj one of their very famous king even occupied uh, kanauj and the last important king who was rajyapala was driven out of kanauj by mohammad of by mahmud of ghazni right and so these are the gujar pratihara they were a huge huge kingdom then there were the tomars and i really like the tomars because they founded delhi my favorite city so uh, they were also rajputs and they were the dynasty was founded by anangapala then we come to the chauhans who are also rajput who ruled from jaipur in the 7th century ce and they later extended to punjab delhi bundelkhand etc and they are the one uh, from whom we get prithviraj chauhan okay the last ruler was prithviraj 3 and between them there's between him and this girl called sanyogita there's this fictional love story and uh, sanyogita was the daughter of a king called gahadwala and of a gahadwala king and prithviraj was not invited to her swayamvar 
so he went and he took her and he married her anyway so this is a love story that we have then we have the chandelas they were originally feudatories of the pratiharas the gujjar pratiharas that we just spoke about but they later asserted their independence and ruled bundhelkhand that is in up and mp and they constructed the khajurao temples in mp very very important in the 10th and 11th century very important please open it up see it see the images appreciate the beauty appreciate the open mindedness of our uh, you know ancient civilizations and uh, remember that the Chand- khajurao temples were constructed under the chandelas who were a rajput dynasty and uh, one of the important temples of the khajurao temples is kandariya mahadev temple which was built around 1000 ce dedicated to lord shiv then we come to the chalukyas and the chalukyas are also known as solankis and they basically ruled over gujarat from uh, 1940 to 942 to 1244 and they should not be confused with the Sal- southern chalukya dynasty so these are chalukyas and that the ones that we spoke about when we were spoken speaking about vatapi were the chalukya so please don't confuse them i know that there are a lot of uh, repeated names and similar spellings etc but uh, just i'm trying to point all of them out to you so keep those things in mind and under king bhim 1 Mahmud of Ghazni destroyed the Somnath temple very 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 important very contentious point of history this destruction of a temple has been converted into a major bone of contention between Hindus and Muslims in the country and it is used to di- divide a wedge between common between a, a, a otherwise united people right so you really need to know about the this uh, plundering of the somnath temple and because mahmud of ghazni destroyed the somnath temple the trope has been contra- constructed that muslims are somehow some horrible people who came and they uh, ripped our culture apart and they have no respect but essentially what we've been studying all throughout our uh, conflicts and battles and they go into other people what do you think they are doing when they go and conquer some other territories are they not destroying the temples are they not destroying things that they the uh, areas that they are destroying those people are proud of attached to culturally mean something to them identify with of course they are entire history that we've studied of india has all been about invasions and warfare and in fact uh, getting uh, money getting revenue to get revenue warfare and loot was a legitimate part during that time just how taxes are currently a legitimate part of how the government earns its revenue that time revenue revenue could be earned legitimately through wars and extortions so that is what mahmud of ghazni did but modern historians especially historians under the colonial times really really distorted this uh, idea into using it to twist indian society into something else that is into calling it hindu society as such invaded by muslims that's not true we've always had such wonderful wonderful diverse religions and cultures as a part of the, this land and we ha- we have always been accepting so until we start talking in this way there's no need for us to actually fight right so that is what you need to understand from the story of somnath so it was um, invaded by, and destroyed by mahmud of ghazni under the chalukyas of uh, gujarat and uh, chaulukya has also built jain temples at mount abu and these are called the dilwara temples okay you can look at this a little bit then we come to the palas and the senas not very important palas were buddhists who ruled from bengal over nepal assam and orissa but we need to know a little bit about who were the rulers at that side as, as well we've just been talking about southern india and the ganga plains for now and then there were the senas who succeeded the palas so same area essentially but uh, they constructed their areas to Bengal and then we come to Raj Tarangini now Raj Tarangini is not an empire or a dynasty it's a book and it's a book written in the 12th century by Kalhana and this is the book that is a very important source for Kashmir so you need to know about it because we no longer speak in mainstream history of the Ganga plains right when we talk about history we talk about history of India as much as we can so you need to know what was happening in north east south west of india at all points of time so yeah so there was raj tarangini written by kalhana in the 12th century and he talks about the nagar kota dynasty that even extended to punjab and kanauj under a king called lalita aditya mukta pita and under the utpala dynasty of kashmir he uh, kashmir was ruled by a queen that is queen didda then we come to 
Kamarupa. Kamarupa was the kingdom in Assam, and this before after this kingdom came the Ahoms uh, around fifteen twenty uh, twenty fifty three from Burma, and till now there was the Kamarupa dynasty. So you need to know these two dynasties for Assam, Kamarupa and Ahoms, and before we also looked at the Palas. Then we come to a little bit of society and culture in northern India. So we are only talking about northern India. Southern India, I'll talk about later. Uh, so this is five hundred to twelve hundred C E. Overall, we are looking at the thematic changes. So practice of sati began and jaha. That is, uh, that's the practice when uh, royal ladies would burn themselves to prevent themselves from being captured from raiding kingdoms, okay, or kings, etc. And tantricism emerged in East India and spread widely because it was really open to all castes and uh, women as well, unlike Brahmanism. And the cult of Shakti developed. The cult of basically they believe that birth is really mysterious, and because women can give birth, and women are there's something mysterious powers that women have, etc. And miniature paintings and illustrated manuscripts developed at this point. This is really important. They really really took off under the Mughals, right? And the Indian version of feudalism developed. So feudalism as an idea, it was conceptualized to describe the time before capitalism in Europe, but in general now the idea has been extended to large large parts of the world so instead of calling it feudalism we'll call it the indian version of feudalism because essentially the idea of feudalism is not what was happening in india it was a completely different arrangement that we have just named feudalism out of convention then um, vajrayana buddhism emerged and this buddhism even recognized female deities for example Ta uh, tara devi was an important deity then let's talk a little bit about southern india now here the religion uh, the, under li religion bhakti cults of nayanars that is shaivites and alvars emerged and the lingayat movement started in karnataka started which uh, was led by basava and basically the lingayats were shaivites obviously against idol worship caste and the vedas shankaracharya of kerala i am sure you've heard about him there's a shankaracharya temple in uh, srinagar so shankaracharya of kerala was born around the 8th and or 9th century CE and he preached advaita that there is uh, only oneness of god and he traveled throughout india to spread his message there were also philosophers like ramanuju and madhav at this point and popularization of tamil kannad and telugu literature happened till now we've only talked about sanskrit literature a little bit of sangam literature and uh, about buddha preaching in prakrit so this is the time 500 to 1200 ce when tamil kannada and telugu literature is also developing thank you so much i hope you enjoyed the lesson hi guys in this lesson we are going to move on from talking about ancient history to talking about medieval history i am nandini and this is the cash course presented by me on all of indian history from prehistory to independence i did my undergrad in history honors so in this lesson we'll talk about first about the in afghan invasions that helped the destabilization of northern and central india and made space for the delhi sultanate to solidify sorry and then we'll talk about the five dynasties that were there under the delhi sultanate that's the slave kings the khaljis the tughlaqs the sayyids and the lodhis then we'll talk a little bit about society and culture underneath under the delhi sultanate this is the only lesson i'm going to do over the delhi sultanate please pay attention i won't be doing a more detailed study of the delhi sultanate any time soon okay definitely not before these prelims so let's talk about the afghan if invasions mahmud ruled over ghazni between 19 uh 997 and 1030 we know that he came and plundered somnath temple we studied about this in the last lesson under which kingdom chalukyas right not the chalukyas of gujarat and he was a turk who adopted persian language and culture and he invaded india many 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 times at least 17 and uh, so this was the first afghan invader mahmud of ghazni then there was muizuddin mohammad ghori who we basically called mohammad ghori he also had a brother so uh, that's why muizuddin is also sometimes used but let's talk about mohammad ghori who came and invaded india between 17 1173 and 1206 and he captured sindh and punjab and then he fought two wars against prithviraj chauhan to capture delhi and he did manage to do that he won the second battle that is the battle of tehran and this marked the beginning of turkish rule in india now mohammad ghori died in 1206 and the slave dynasty was established under him and he was succeeded by his slave qutbuddin aibak now slaves 
when we talk about in the muslim kingdom aren't slaves like how we talk about them in the plantation workers or when we talk about slavery in america they are actually they belong yes to someone but they are treated very well almost like sons and in fact even like sons in which they inherit the empire of the of their master right so that is how the slave dynasty began when ghori died suddenly and his slave kutubuddin aibak uh, received the throne of delhi from him his en- different different slaves got different different parts of his empire kutubuddin aibak got delhi and uh, the slave dynasty is also known as the ilbari turk dynasty or the mamluk dynasty and uh, bakhtiyar khalji took over the ghori's possessions in bihar and bengal this is important because we know that the dynasty soon shifted to khalji dynasty aibak died very soon in 2010 and uh, so the delhi sultanate was properly established by iltutmish iltutmish had a long nice rule of 25 years in which he was able to really uh attain control over more kingdoms and solidify the administration etc and uh, kutubuddin aibak started the kutub minar and ultutmish finished the kutub minar then we come to the next uh, queen that is razia sultan and she was the first woman ruler of sultanate and even of delhi itself and she was ultutmish's daughter he had son too but they were quite unpopular but the nobles didn't really appreciate a woman being in power and they plotted against her and she was killed within 4 years she only reigned for about 4 years and she was succeeded by giyasuddin balban giyasuddin balban was a very very powerful noble who wrested power and he had been a slave of intutmish and he was very strong hard working and intelligent ruler and he organized the most efficient administration and army of the slave dynasty so okay before we move let's just revise quickly ghori invaded india died there was kutubuddin aibak after kutubuddin aibak there was ultutmish ultutmish then razia sultan and after razia sultan there was ghaiyasuddin balban who again ruled for many many years and basically organized and implemented the army administration etc then we come to khaljis remember i told you that uh, jalaluddin khalji was uh, sorry bakhtiyar khalji was in uh, to cover ghori's possessions in bengal and bihar so that is where the khalji dynasty was and they came and established uh, a proper dynasty in bihar and they soon tried to take over delhi and the most important khalji dynasty ruler was alauddin khalji he ruled for again a long time almost 20 years and he was a very competent ruler he really suppressed revolts and other powerful nobles and he expanded his empire immensely this was the largest empire since ashokan time seen in india he defeated the hoysalas of karnataka he built siri fort important he built siri fort why to keep out the mongols very important and uh, he established the he finalized the system of iktidari iktidari is like the indian counterpart of feudalism and uh, it was uh, adapted to mansabdari under the mughals right and uh, very important changes in administration army and tax system un- took place under him especially the iktidari system and he di- died of fever and he was succeeded by ghazi malik ghazi malik was the slave of balban remember under the last ruler under the slave dynasty yeah so okay just one clarification guys i'm not telling you about each and every single ruler just the very important ones okay so he ruled for about 5 years and he annexed Tel- annexed telangana and madurai and bengal and what happened is that when he annexed bengal his son prepared like a wooden platform for him to welcome him there but the platform collapsed and he died and no one knows if this was accident or deliberate and yeah so uh, after alauddin khalji the tughlaq dynasty was formed sorry ghazi malik he was a tughlaq and his son was a tughlaq as well and muhammad bin tughlaq was the most famous tughlaq and uh, you must have, must have heard like is this a tughlaqan step that uh, modi has taken with demonetization we'll soon study the reference so what happened is that he took many many expansionary projects and most didn't work like he tried to capture uh, khurasan iraq china etc all these didn't work but he did manage to defeat the mongols quite a bit and he finished the fort of tughlaqabad very important which was started by his, ghiyasuddin okay so what he did was he tried to change the capital to devgiri that is dolatabad in the deccan and uh, barani who is a historian from the next ruler that we'll talk about that is feroz shah tughlaq so he wrote a book called feroz shah 
तारीख ए फिरोज शाही एंड ही वॉज वेरी वेरी क्रिटिकल ऑफ मोहम्मद बिन तुगला सो ही मोहम्मद एक्चुअली इंट्रोड्यूस्ड न्यू करेंसी वॉट हैपन इज दैट देर वॉज अ शॉर्टेज ऑफ सिल्वर इन द किंगडम एंड ही सेट कि ओके लाउ लेस जस्ट यूज ब्रॉन्स इंस्टेड वी कैन यूज दैट एज करेंसी दैट विल हैव द पावर ऑफ द स्टेट बिहाइंड इट सो इट विल बी यूज जस्ट लाइक हाउ वी यूज पेपर मनी द वैल्यू ऑफ वन द पेपर इन अ थाउजेंड रुपी नोट इज एन एक्चुअली थाउजेंड रुपीज बट दैट इज द आइडिया बिहाइंड दैम दैट द स्टेट सपोर्ट्स इट इफ द स्टेट स्टॉप सपोर्टिंग इट इट बिकम्स वर्थ लेस वी जस्ट विटनेस दैट राइट एंड मोहम्मद डिसाइडेड टू डू दैट बट दे डेंट हैव फैंसी प्रिंटिंग मशीन एंड मिंटिंग मशीन सो एवरी वन स्टार्टेड प्रिंटिंग देयर ओन ब्रॉन्स करेंसीज एंड इट वॉज बेसिकली अ वेरी डिजास्टरस पॉलिसी एंड एवरी वन बिगैन फॉर्चिंग कॉइन्स मोहम्मद तुगलक वॉज सक्सीडेड बाई फिरूज शाह तुगलक एंड ही बेसिकली चिल्ड आउट फॉर लाइक थर्टी ईयर्स थर्टी फाइव ईयर्स एंड ही डेंट डू एनी थिंग ही जस्ट यू नो लेट एवरी वन डू वट एवर दे वॉन्टेड द एम्पायर कॉन्ट्रैक्टेड क्वाइट मैसिवली लाइक इट बिकेम रियली स्मॉल बट हिडन केयर ही वॉज जस्ट लाइक आई एम गोन बिल्ड सम किनाज एंड हॉस्पिटल्स एंड रेस्ट हाउसेज एंड यू गैस कैन रेस्ट एंड चिल एंड एग्रीकल्चर इज गोन बिकम बेटर बट ही डिड बैन पेंटिंग बिकॉज दैट्स अन इस्लामिक अकॉर्डिंग टू हिम and so his reign was largely peaceful he didn't undertake any expansions etc and after his death the mur of samarkand a mongol invaded india terribly and the sultanate shrank more and more and more then we come to a sayyid dynasty very small dynasty uh, khizr khan established it and he was made the governor by multan of timur we just studied about uh, timur of samarkand right and uh, there were three more sayyid rulers but they were basically not important in history and the lodis took over now bhulal lodi established the lodi dynasty and he extended the empire over gwalior jaunpur upper up again the delhi sultanate started expanding and sikandar lodi succeeded bhulhul and he extended the empire even more and finally we have ibrahim lodi nobody liked him so his own minister uh, actually a governor of punjab that is dalat khan lodi he was like Listen, Babur, you come here. I don't like this ruler. Please, uh, you know, defeat him, remove him, and you start ruling India instead. So that's what happened. Lodi was killed at the first battle of Panipat, which he fought with Babur, and that was that of the Delhi Sultanate. Let's just read a little bit about so so society and culture underneath them. So, women. what was the status of women widow remarriage was banned at this point of time before this essentially it was allowed and the islamic practice of hijab influenced upper caste hindu women into adopting the parda and the word hindu came into being used in this religious sense before this hindus were the people of the land of indus indus and sindh that from that the word hindu was used but now uh, the word hindu is used in a religious sense as in those who practice hinduism versus those who practice islam okay that sort of idea and spinning on the charka started that is the loom came and the karkhana that's the fracti system began and many travel writers like ibn batuta came and he wrote rihla about india and al biruni came and he wrote tarikh e hind about india even barani wrote about tarikh e firuz shah so good time for literature and barani also wrote about fatwa e jahangiri in which he interestingly talked about caste among muslims and the architecture obviously drastically changed there were changes in painting style music style like qawali and khyal developed and again literature prithviraj rasoo was written by chand bardai and leela masroo was written by amir khusro amir khusro was a very very famous poet uh, and he wrote in hindi urdu hindu hindi urdu persian and arabic and he wrote romances and poetry and uh, generally his poetry is still appreciated today Thank you so much. I hope you like this lesson. I hope you're liking this series. Please rate, review, and recommend, and let me know how you like it. Thank you. Hi guys. In this lesson, we'll talk a little bit about the Bahamani and the Vijayanagar kingdoms, and mostly about the Mughals. I'm Nandini, and I'm presenting this course to you, which is a crash course on Indian history from prehistory to independence. I did my undergrad in history honors. This is the content list. We'll be talking about the Bahamani and the Vijayanagar kingdom, and then we'll be talking about the Mughals, the important Mughals from uh, Babur to Aurangzeb. If you want to see the rest of the Mughals, you can go and look at my lesson on consolidation of British Empire in India. And uh, there, they have a les. I have a lesson on decline of Mughals. So we'll talk in that. I've talked in detail about the Mughals after Aurangzeb, and then we'll talk a little bit about society and culture. So the Bahamani kingdom was there in the. 
it formed out of a revolt out of uh, Muhammad bin Tughlaq's reign and uh, Alauddin Bahman Shah emerged as the ruler and they basically conquered the area of uh, Maharashtra Karnataka etc even Telangana Gulbarg was their capital and they conflicted a lot with the Vijayanagar empire under Muhammad Shah I who was the son of Alauddin and uh, the empire was always always engaged in conflicts and they broke up and the remains of this empire were actually five small kingdoms and uh, these actually continued till the times when the british came then we talk about the vijayanagar empire it's a very important empire from the point of view of art and architecture so please do read about that it was founded by harihara and bukka of the sangamma dynasty and it was actually ruled by four dynasties that is sangam saluva tuluva and aravidu and they also fought many many battles and krishna dev raya was their most important ruler of the tulava dynasty and he even uh, wrote a book in telugu that is uh, amukta malyada i can't really pronounce it now he had these eight court poets which he called the his ashtadigas which are actually eight elephants and uh, kedi is krishna dev raya and one of the famous ones i'm sure you must have seen the cartoon telani tenali raman he was a court poet and the architecture of vijayanagar is very important so please look at these uh, specific uh, terms which is the architect the city of hampi gopuram gol gumbas the then the temples under vijayanagar then dolatabad fort and charminar etc it's given very well in ncert uh, class 12 part 2 chapter 3 okay so go look at it then we come to the mughals we already l- have learned about how he fought the battle of panipat with ibrahim lodi and won this battle was in 1525 and he was actually born in fargana and he came and he fought the battle and he fought many more battles and he expanded his empire but he died in uh, 1530 and he left behind a diary of memoirs which we really used to study about him he was succeeded by his son humayun who ruled over the mughal empire between 1530 and 1540 and then again in 1555 and he fought many battles to retain the area but there were so many that he couldn't really win all of them and he lost a lot of area he was specially defeated by sher shah sur in 1540 and uh, when sher shah sur died in 1540 humayun was able to regain delhi soon after but i shall not that's on about a decade after but when as soon as humayun regained the empire he died unfortunately his tomb was commissioned by his wife begum bega you must have seen pictures or actually seen humayun's tomb in delhi right little bit about sher shah sur he was originally sher khan but he adopted the title of sher shah sur after defeating himayu he ruled from bengal to indus and he reorganized the revenue and judicial and uh, administrative system and that system was used throughout the mughal period after that also he built roads and rest houses that's really important we still use the Gang- grand tank road right uh, it was built from chittagong to kabul but we use it from uh, calcutta to amritsar now nh1 and nh2 and his changes formed the b- basis of the future mughal rule we know but his successors were very weak and therefore humayun could take over now i could make an entire course just on akbar but we have to keep it very short so i'll tell you what all you need to study first a little bit of introduction he was only 13 when he assumed the throne and his advisor was bairam khan and he actually fought the second ba- battle of panimat against hemu a minister of adil shah from bengal all of his conquests were quite interesting so you can read about these conquests that is malwa gondwana chittor and ahmednagar not very important but very interesting stories in themselves and you re- definitely need to know about raja todarmal and his land revenue system he was a minister of akbar you need to know about bin birbal you need to know about din e ilahi the religion that akbar started and about the izab ibadat khana again the place of uh, religious discussions that he started his jizya policy sulhe kul that is universal peace that idea that akbar came up with his rajput policy and his there was a his court writer that is abul fazal he wrote two books that is n a akbari and akbar nama you need to know about that and basavan was a very famous painter in akbar's court and his architecture famous under him was fatehpur sikri bulandarwaza and agra fort 
Then we come to Jahangir. Yes, he's the Salim from the Salim and Al Harkali story of Mughal Azam, and he made peace with the Rajput Kingdom of Mewar after almost a century of rivalry between the Mughals and Mewar, and he married Noor Jahan. And most people think that Noor Jahan was actually the brains behind Jahangir's em- entire empire, and Noor Jahan was actually the wife of one of the governors of Bengal. But Jahangir really liked her, so he's like, okay, I'm gonna take your wife and marry her, okay? And he built Shalimar Bagh at Kashmir. Then we come to Shah Jahan. He was earlier called Prince Khurram, and he is only known for his love for Mumtaz and building the Taj Mahal. I don't even as a history student we didn't study too much about Shah Jahan outside of Taj Mahal, but he also built the Jama Masjid, Red Fort, importantly, and Shalimar Bagh at Lahore. Then we come to Aurangzeb. Aurangzeb defeated and killed his brother Dara Shiko. Because Dara Shikoh was the son favored by Shah Jahan to take over the Mughal throne, and Aurangzeb fought many wars, and he really expanded the expa- empire, and he especially fought against Shivaji in the Deccan, and he stayed in the Deccan for twenty five years. So this was really problematic because Delhi, as a, uh, as the capital center, started losing power, and uh, it became susceptible to invasions from Nadir Shah, etc. And he died in Ahmednagar, Aurangzeb, in 1707. And he had reimposed the jizya and destroyed many temples. But at the same time, he removed the jizya in Mewar and gave grants to Hindu mats and temples as well. So you can't call him a Muslim bigot as many historians have done. He was actually a very confusing man, and most of the things that he did were for political gains, not so much fueled by religious malice or whatever. Okay, and he spent too much money on. Uh, Uh, his uh, wars and Shah Jahan had spent too much money on the architecture and his lavish lifestyle in general, and therefore the Mughal Empire became weak and it started declining. And in the meantime, these, uh, like I said, Aurangzeb shifted the capital to Dal- Dalatabad. So Nadir Shah and Ahmad Shah, who were uh, Persian Arabian uh, people, they invaded India, and Nadir Shah took away the Kohinoor diamond and the peacock stone. Throne and Ahmad Shah Abdali also made many many invasions, and the Delhi, Agra, and the surrounding areas began to decline. As the Mughals declined, the British gained power. But let's look a little bit at society and culture. So the land revenue system system under them was the mansabdari system. You can read a little bit, and you know, just keep an idea of short note ab- about uh, the mansabdari system in your mind. The Khalisa land was the land that was owned directly by the empire. This is also important to know. Then Mughal architecture is very important. I've tried to mention most important works as we have gone along the lesson, so you can go back and look at that. Then we have the paintings. Uh, the Mughal paintings were basically Persian miniatures that were used to illustrate manuscripts, and the Rajput art had many schools. This was also really prevalent during the society and uh, during the uh, Mughal times. And there was a Hindustani classical mu- music that flourished, and you uh, you all must have heard of Tansen. Ram Charit Manas was written by Tulsi Das during the Mughal era as- itself, and many important Sanskrit works were translated into Persian. So this is important. And again, many historical accounts were produced, like Akbar Nama, Babur Nama, and Akbari, etc. And we use all that as sources for. studying about the mughals thank you so much i hope you enjoyed the lesson in the next lesson we'll start talking a little bit about modern india thank you